Hello, fellow Plegians. Welcome to our meeting for uh, October of 2022. I had the pleasure of introducing David Roper tonight. He's an author um, who you've probably all seen a number of his articles in the wind, or in, excuse me, in uh, Point, East. Point East magazine. That's how I came across him this past year. And he has been gracious enough to introduce us to his new book. So I am going to not give too much of an intro because you don't want to hear from me. You want to hear from him. Um, he's got a wonderful history of sailing um, and seamanship in addition to his writing. So I'm sure we're all going to be very entertained. David, come on up and uh, start presenting. Welcome to Pelagic. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for uh, having me, everybody, virtually and, and in person. Uh, I, I think so. Actually, maybe not. Yeah, maybe reading. Really. yeah. Maybe you don't need that anymore. Okay. I. It's indifferent. That'll work. That'll work. Just like that. That's good. Uh, no, that I'm sorry. That's okay. I can see it now. Now that you carried it all the way over, I'll uh, I'll elaborate a little bit uh, from an in introduction standpoint, just so that you have some perspective. Um, uh, I went aboard a sailboat in a basket at um, one month old in in Hingham, uh, not too far from here, and. Uh, um, have been sailing ever since. Uh, most of my uh, most of my writings over the years have been around uh, around boats. Uh, I worked my way up in terms of licenses to the point that uh, I obtained a master's license and ended up running a uh, 135 foot stern wheel cruise ship on the Mississippi River for three years. Um, that's reflected in some of the stories in my books. Um, and then uh, I ran a, um, a, a big Alden schooner out of Marblehead. And I've been going to Maine every summer on my own boat, which is a 31 foot um, sloop named Elsa. If you read Points East Magazine, you'll know a lot about, about Elsa. Um, I'm gonna take you through, uh, uh, this is my latest book. Um, a little plug here. Uh, I have some books here. Uh, Watching for Mermaids, which was a three-time bestseller. Um, I have some of those copies. I also have the book about uh, a river pilot on the Mississippi River, a novel called Rounding the Bend, about a, a really interesting river pilot that I that I knew when I ran the river. And then I have um, uh, Beyond Mermaids, which is the latest book that came out. I'm going to read read from, from this book. I'm going to read three pieces. And if you're still not yawning and you want one more, I'll, there'll be one more short piece. Okay. Um, I tried to pick things that were uh, fun and local. Uh, they're, they're, oh, there we go. There were, um, that's a little much. That's all right. But they're fun. Um, uh, for my 50th birthday, my wife uh, gave me a circumnavigation of Newfoundland and a Russian icebreaker. Now that's an odd birthday present, um, but I, it was even odder what happened. So I'm gonna read this story, which interestingly in these times is appropriate, the title, Why I Love Russians. Maybe I should, maybe I should get rid of this, it just occurred to me now. But this was written in a, a couple of years ago uh, about something that happened a decade ago. So I'm gonna take you through that and then uh, read a couple more. 
And if you want any more, as my wife says, he'll go on forever. But for my 50th birthday, my wife gave me a circumnavigation of Newfoundland on a Russian icebreaker. One might question her intent, sending her husband on a trip around the rock at midlife. One might even suspect an ulterior motive. But the confounding element was that it appeared that she truly wanted to come along. How lucky can a husband be? Our dented extra thick steel chariot was one vessel called the Lubakov or Lova, named after, okay, you Jeopardy fanatics, you have 10 seconds. Yes, it was after the famous theater actress, gifted singer, and first recognized star of Soviet cinema. We boarded her in Newfoundland, in St. John, Newfoundland, honestly at $535 US for the week for everything, including three meals and afternoon snacks, I wasn't expecting much. In fact, a part of me just hoped to make it back. Old Lova, as I grew to affectionately call her, awaited the 60 of us, her expedition tourists, in our polar fleece hats and our orange jackets as we filed down the pier toward the gangway. It took us along a crumpled steel hull that reminded me of a soup can rescued halfway through the kitchen compactor cycle. As you know, my dear, I'm not the worldliest guy in any culinary sense, but I do hope that we do not have a Russian chef, I said to my wife as we climbed aboard the metal boarding platform. And just a quick quote from the Guardian's Culinary Review that I happened to peruse before we left home, quote, at its worst, Russian food is, is lumps of unide unidentifiable grizzly meat served with undercooked potatoes. But then I spied Natasha at the top of the gangway. Nothing lumpy, unidentifiable, or grisly there. I turned to my wife who didn't appear to have noticed me notice Natasha. And I said quickly, I'll be cool with the food no matter what we have, honey, because it's not about the food. She rolled her eyes. Sweet cabin girls, huh, Dave? Was all she said. We'd been 20 years together at that point. So off we went. Lova's big, slow turning engine, helping her lumber away through the majestic high cliff entrance of St. John Harbor, things were looking up. There was a Canadian chef, good. A small private cabin for us, way down in the bowels of the ship, close to the engine room and warm, good. A naturalist and a historian, very good. And free roam of the entire ship, including the bridge, to me, the best. And of course, there was Natasha. She was assigned to make up our cabin each morning. My wife befriended her and learned she hadn't seen her family in a year and a half. She had taken this job to try to save some desperately needed money. Standing to the side of the tiny cabin, I tried to look thoughtful, sensitive, and cool in my matching fleece outfit. I'll fast forward the tape to get to the good stuff since by now you all figure that this is about Natasha. We steamed along the north coast of Newfoundland to Terranova National Park in search of moose, lynx, bald eagles, and carnivorous pitcher plants. Proceeded to Lanso Meadows where Norseman Leif Erikson is thought to have founded Vinland in 1000 AD. We continued across the Strait of Belle Isle to Red Bay in Labrador, then continued on to Labrador's, to Newfoundland's Grossmoor National Park. There we climbed the Precambrian cliffs and searched for giant Arctic hare before heading to the St. Pierre and Miquelon Islands for a taste of France 
and a history of bootlegging. Our final stop was Francois, pronounced Francois by the Newfoundlanders, a remote fishing outport with a population of 124. It was only accessible by boat and helicopter. Now what's important here is that no vessel the size of the old Lova, and certainly not the old Lova herself, had ever squeezed into this harbor. It looked impossible. Of course, I had to be on the bridge with my Russian friends. As we attempted the entrance, the captain, like 100% of the entire Russian population on board, was a chain smoker. It was tense. I didn't need to know Russian to understand that. 15 minutes later, we are inside the deep fjord harbor, anchored under 900 foot cliffs. The captain, a gruff looking unshaven man in a Navy pea coat, glanced at me as he collapsed into his chair. That was a three cigarette entrance, <laughs> he said. The tiny town of Francois lay before us, nestled along a boardwalk at the foot of majestic overhanging rocks. We boarded our Zodiacs and headed ashore. The townspeople were throwing a party and a dance for us. It was magical and a long night. My wife gave up before I did and took one of the Zodiacs back to the ship. I couldn't get enough of the place. And after the party, I walked along the waterfront on their boardwalk before catching the last boat back. I was the final one of the 60 of us. A full moon rose over the mountains and the Lova's stern as I thanked the first mate and climbed the ship's ladder. The ship was asleep. Even most of the deck lights were out. I decided to climb to the after deck observation platform to get a good view of the moon before going back to my cabin. As I climbed, I heard music. It was a sultry, seductive, belly dance kind of music. And there before me, under the glow of one of the ship's yellow deck lights, alone on the spacious steel top deck was Natasha. The seductive rhythm rose from a boom box by her feet as she danced before me, giving a new level of meaning to the word undulation. I started to look back away so as to not spoil her private moment, but then she looked up at me, embarrassed. I tipped my fleece hat, nodded, and began to back away again. In a serpentine manner, she moved toward me, making a come hither gesture with her arm. Later, when I returned to our cabin, my wife was still awake. A small light was on by her bunk bed. Glad you made it back. I was worried, she said, as I gently closed the door. Remarkable spot, she continued, as she rolled over and turned off the light. The moon shone through the big round steel porthole, bathing me in a gauzy half light. Magical, I said, it was just magical. So, so I, I give about 50 talks a year and my, my wife comes to about as few as she can, but I mean, she, she usually is in the audience um, going, okay, good, wrap it up. And, and tonight she said, uh, as I was leaving, which ones are you reading? And um, I said, da, 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 and, and I'm going to read Natasha. And she said, oh, you better tell him that nothing happened. <laughs> and nothing happened. Um, by the way, aside on the Lubakov or Lova, um, uh, it, I don't know if anybody read this, but the, it was, she was certainly in the news because 
soon after we got off, um, she was scrapped and uh, was being towed to wherever, you know, you've seen these YouTube videos where they slide them up in these foreign countries and chop them up. She was being towed and the tow line broke and she was rumored to be absolutely filled with rats and nobody wanted to get back on a true story. And she floated out. I forget where they were, but she just floated out and floated out. That's it. No more or Lova. Um, she knew she, I'm a high latitude guy. I'm not a, you can see by my skin that I don't do well with the sun. I like to go north and she knows I love high latitude stuff. And so she found a company called Marine Expeditions. That was a Canadian company that chartered the old Lova and they, and they did this trip and, um, she, she booked it as a surprise. And um, I thought it was a huge success. She, she did okay, you know. Um, uh, and then they went bankrupt at 525 bucks. You can understand why. Uh, they went bankrupt and, um, you know, that was, that was the end of it. Um, so that, anyway, that's how it came to be. But I've always been interested in, uh, in high latitude stuff. Um, one of the most amazing stories is a, is a book um, about a guy who went way up north to Baffin Island and, and froze in for the winter, just alone, he and the polar bears. And uh, it's quite a story. It's called, uh, it's called North to the Night by a guy named Alva Simon. It's a, it's a remarkable book about survival. And uh, so anyway, that's the story on, on that. I'd like to uh, take us now to, um, to a, uh, a horrible disease that I caught at sea and the outcome of it. This is called, after touching leaves of three, don't go out to sea. I was run over by a Boston whaler. I heard over Bermuda AM radio, that I was assumed lost at sea. I put 314 passengers through a Mississippi River tornado. I've been downstream from a busted sewage holding tank. And those are just for starters in my life. But nothing, nothing has compared to my encounter with the dreaded Toxicodendrum radicans and its internal alien monster, Eurystial. It all started innocently enough. It was July and time for me to head to Maine as I have done for the past 30 years. I usually go solo. It allows me to sing loudly and off key for three days. My wife, Mary Kay, drives up to meet me. Before I left this time, she asked me if I might clear the weeds and the rampant vines from our back hill. But cover yourself very well, she said. There's rumor of poison ivy lurking on that hillside. I don't get poison ivy, I said confidently. She gave me that do what I say school teacher look of hers. Just because you've never gotten it doesn't mean you won't get it. What's a big deal anyway? Isn't poison ivy something little camper kids get? The ones that you see covered with that pink calamine lotion stuff? Anyway. The day before I was to head offshore, I cleared the hillside. The next day, about 12 miles off of Cape Ann and headed east, I felt a silly, nagging little itch on my left wrist. Whatever. I was making good time towards the Isle of Shoals where I planned to stop for the night. I knew I would arrive just before the thick black dungeon fog and, uh, and thunderstorm that I swear hits me every year at about 6.45 p.m. just after I pick up a mooring there. So what's with this itching? Now it's on my other wrist. Heck, now it's going up my right arm. Better wash it off. Mary Kay said something about this urushiol oil not being too good on human body parts. 
What about calamine lotion? No, none of that aboard. That's for those sissy camper kids anyway. Pinot Grigio. Ah, plenty of that behind the port bunk. This is the theme. That might do the trick. At the very least, it will stop the itching. Paren, that trick, by the way, is to pour it down your throat and not over the poisoned body parts. Works extremely well that way when taken in some quantity until around 0200 hours when it, has, when it has worn off and you will then wake up again itching and scratching like a maniac. Two days later, by the time I reached the eastern part of Casco Bay and my wife came aboard, I was wrapped in gauze. My wife fears very little in life, but poison ivy terrifies her. Did you sit on my bunk? Did you touch this? What towels did you use? You need to stay on your side of the boat from now on. Do you have calamine lotion? No, but I have something better. It could even work around the clock if I took it nonstop. But I, I don't think that's the best idea if I'm the captain. What are you talking about? It's called Pinot Grigio. No prescription necessary. You just need a proper ID. Yes, it's more expensive than calamine, but heck, it's all I have to treat this dreaded thing. She rolled her eyes. Debbie. Might even be an antidote for you, dear. I'll share some with you. In your very own glass, of course. Well, things got worse. It started to rain for three days, and then the Pinot Grigio was running low. One night at about 2.01 a.m., I awoke in such a state that I considered jumping into the icy main water. My hope was not to eradicate the itching. I now believed it would never go away. No, my hope was to drown. It was that bad. Why don't you just leave the boat here and go home, Mary Kay said from her side of the cabin. Why, so I can itch at home? I replied, if I'm going to itch, I'm going to do it on my beloved boat, on my beloved Maine coast with my beloved wife. When I dropped her off in Brunswick, Maine, we were able to take her car and find a CVS store. I hurried in and headed for the pharmacy section. Excuse me, but where's the calamine lotion? What type do you need, sir? Calamine or caladrill? I mean, how bad is your condition? The pharmacist asked. At this point, showing him any body part would do. But I held up my left inner wrist, a particularly gruesome manifestation of the dreaded toxicendrome radicons. Oh, he said with a withering look, that'd be calamine, but you're close to a staph infection. I bought the Brunswick, Maine CVS store's entire stock of calamine lotion, along with enough gauze to resupply the Mass General Emergency Room. My wife dropped me off at the boat. I went below, took off my clothes, and had myself a calamine shower. Then, alone, I headed to sea. I now had calamine yeah. and Pinot you know, Grigio. And good, warm weather, but it just got worse. My clothes aggravated the poison ivy. So on the last day, I took them off, all of them. This was fine when you're offshore, quite nice. And I really got used to it. As I rounded Cape Ann and adjusted my course close to the Eastern Point breakwater in Gloucester, I began to encounter other boaters and sailed close by a young family anchored and fishing from their little cabin cruiser. Forgetting that the entirety of my sartorial splendor consisted of only a large straw hat and sunglasses, I raised my gauze wrapped arm and waved. No one waved back. We all know why. 
So that's. I'm just going to read a, a, a piece of one more that um, uh, that's. Uh, I write a lot about my dad because my dad gave me this boating addiction. Um, and um, he was a wonderful guy. And um, it, I've written a lot of stories about uh, when he was 85 and our daughter was 15 and I was 50. So we were 35 years apart, all of us. We spent a couple of weeks on the main coast together, a teenage girl, her 85 year old grandfather and, and me and uh, um, carried on the tradition. Um, there's, uh, uh, there's a lot I learned from him and I, I try to convey it here about getting older. Um, and that's, that's what this story is about. This is, I think it's the last story in the book and it's called polysulfide. And if you don't know about polysulfide, you will in a minute, but I'm just gonna read from the middle of it so that um, you don't start going like this, like my wife does when I'm talking. From the moment we're born, we're learning the ropes. We're an open book, a tiny baby, completely vulnerable to everything with no control over anything. No prejudices towards good or evil, no plan whatsoever, except to scream for food. I probably screamed for food, you too. Someone must have been good enough to pick us up, maybe to stop our screaming. Someone must have cared. Caring right to the end, I think, should be our number one job. From the moment we're born, we're also running out of time, getting ever closer to the end of the line. Whether we care or not, the ropes of our lives are full of Gordian knots, stomach knots, relationship, love and marriage knots, job and boss knots, ethical knots, and a seemingly endless, endless string of tangles and bends. There's a lot to learn from being at the end of the line, such as this from this 93 year old, my dad, still smiling after all these years. There in front of us was Phyllis, looking ashamed of her condition and very much out of her element. She sat uncovered under some pines in a field behind a barn, her old rotted mast lying beside her. I stepped back a bit, feeling that our very presence must be embarrassing to her. I hadn't wanted to return to Phyllis in the first place, knowing what we would find in a boat born 60 years ago and long gone from our family care. But it was dad's idea coming back just to see how she'd fared after all those years. I glanced over at my father. He was smiling, moving forward, intently curious. One eye drooped a bit, a remnant of a couple of strokes he'd had a decade before. His old pea green jacket faded and ripped at the pockets, clashed with his blue tweed hat, which sat askew on the back of his head. I'd long ago given up suggesting how he might improve his attire. When I'd made suggestions, he'd simply smiled and said with certainty, nope, that's not what it's all about, Dave. What is it all about, I wondered now. I'd been wanting to ask that, him that for a long time, figuring someone of his age and wisdom, someone who was still smiling after all those years would surely have the answer. But somehow I never could. Maybe I was afraid of his answer or afraid that he wouldn't have one. And then what? I watched as she shuffled, as he shuffled still closer to what remained of the old family boat so little time was left for either of them now. And then I thought of mom, the love of his life for 55 years. She dropped to 88 pounds after her second stroke. Then came the emphysema. 
she couldn't breathe at all without her oxygen. So dad carried around her portable ox oxygen tank in one hand, while with the other, he struggled with both the plastic air hose and my mother's unsteady step. Taking care of mom had become his mission. It was just as well, I thought. It filled a space made by the end of so much else. My two brothers and I were long out of his care. The job of raising us was done. Dad's career had ended many years ago. Even his post-retirement yacht club Commodore stint had gone and his tennis and cribbage partners, most of them were dead. And here he was facing his old beloved boat, which was rotting away in a field far from the sea. My God, I thought, this is the end of the line, Dad. How can you still be smiling? But as usual, I just stood there, mute. A damp early spring wind shook Phyllis's tarp, and I began to shiver. Dad bent down and looked carefully at the peeling, rust-streaked hull of his old friend Phyllis. She's still bleeding, he said. Never could fix that bleeding. The heads were knocked off those galvanized boat nails when she was first built in 1939. The rust just bleeds out, works its way through the surface of the planks. He backed away, slowly straightened, his eyes still focused on the rust in the hull. Oxidation, you can't stop it. Capillary action of some sort brings that rust to the surface of the wood, he said. As he rubbed the stained section of the old hull, I noticed the blotch marks of advanced age on the back of his hand. Then he shook his head slowly. You can putty it, you can paint it, you can treat it any way you want, but you can't stop it. Then he looked down at something purple and yellow at his feet. An early spring crocus had somehow emerged from the winter ravaged half frozen earth. Like that flower, he said, pointing. Wonderful about life, isn't it? Time just moves things along, no matter what. It's just the way things are. I looked down at the crocus, just beginning its journey, then over at Dad. An elderly man, I thought, could never get old, now stood beside me, buffeted by the raw March wind. I wanted to speak, but couldn't. As always, Dad was so wrapped up in the significance of the immediate moment, it didn't seem right to break his focus. And so I looked at Phyllis, the beautiful, resilient wooden boat that had sailed our family through calms and storms was now dwindling away. I remember thinking that given enough time, her timbers would eventually rot right back into the earth, the place from which she, they had sprung as oak, fir, and mahogany trees more than a half century ago. Maybe you should know something, Dad said, looking up at me. It jolted me, that phrase of his. It seemed so strangely serious, profound, and even foreboding, coming from a man who always seemed to operate happily at the, in the moment at hand, whistling his way through life's easy and tough spots. I remember thinking, perhaps this is the time He's chosen to pass on the baton of life's wisdom. Perhaps the something I should know is how to find happiness in the mo most dismal of situations. Perhaps what is coming are instructive words on how to be finally comfortable with myself and to cope with life's all too fleeting passage. Or perhaps, perhaps he just wants to say a few words about how he feels deep down about a certain middle-aged son of his. I turned and gave him my fullest attention, tuning out the sounds of the wind buffeted tarp, the view of the boat and the field around us. Polysulfide, he said. <laughs> what, Dad? Polysulfide. You should know about that stuff. It might absorb the rust, but it hadn't been invented yet. Resilient, long-lasting, gives when necessary, but somehow still sticks. Good stuff. DuPont came up with it. Maybe it was 3M, now that I think about it. I shook my head and smiled. Let's go home, Dad. And we trudged away through the remaining patches of snow, 
both knowing that we'd probably never see Phyllis again. Then dad slowed and he turned slightly, his eyes back on the boat. Better watch ahead, dad, I said. Pay attention, this is a patch, it's slippery, it's slippery, a patch it, we're on. Can you still see it, he asked. See what, dad? Even with her keel in the grave, it's still there. What's still there, I asked, shivering again and beginning to become frustrated. There was a slight edge to my voice. I looked hard, but all I saw was a neglected old boat, down on her luck and out of her element. The grace and the dignity. There's still such grace and dignity, despite it all, he said finally. Grace and dignity, despite it all. I took dad's arm and we headed home smiling. Thank you. What I'm doing now, um, I go to Maine every summer and uh, um, my wife doesn't let me sail there alone anymore. I used to do the offshore part because I really liked, I liked being out there and it really challenges you, but um, you know, I got a couple grandkids now and two kids, and 42 year marriage, and she doesn't really want me to fall overboard. So, so we go to Maine and uh, I use the boat, um, Elsa, the name of the boat is uh, named after my wife's mom, who was a wonderful, uh, woman who was a real pioneering woman and her um, her grandmother grew up in a sod hut in North Dakota. You can imagine spending the winters in a sod hut, but um, there's a pioneering spirit there that always impressed me. Um, so, and it's not a bad move politically to name your boat after your mother-in-law. So, um, uh, and then I, um, I use the boat all year. I have it heated and I, I do my writing in the winter whenever I can on board as well as in my office. And um, I'm a year and a half into a, another book that is about, um, it's based on a, inspired by a true story. And it's about a um, boy growing up alone on a remote main island and what happens to him. Um, so that's not tied up to the boat, but any other questions? Yes. It was Canadian food. It, it was it was good. It was it was okay. And I I wish that I, I have to say that um, that that village of Francois was the most magical place I've ever been. And the fact that you that you cannot get there by car. You, you can get there, I guess, with a helicopter, and you get there by by boat. But and that that village, um, and the fact that those people um, uh, had a dance for us in that village. Um, as a matter of fact, when we went around the south coast of Newfoundland, um, we were going to go to another outport called uh, Ra uh, Ramada. Or, uh, I think it was Ramada, but um, and all all of the ladies of the village of this outport um, baked cookies and pies because they knew that sixty people were coming on a ship, and this was this was twenty years ago, so twenty two years ago. So they, they maybe there's boats visiting now, but um, they were so excited, and then the weather changed, and the ship radioed the outport said that we weren't coming. So they ate all the cookies and the pie. And, and then the weather changed again and they said we were coming. And they, they um, rebaked it all and we indeed, did, we indeed did come. And then we went ashore and I mean, this is just like a rock, you know, and, it, it, and there's a little school and everything. And one of the ladies on the ship, on the, on the Lova was from Manhattan. So a lot more people than on this outport. And 
there were two kids sitting on the edge when we got into the inflatable dinghies to leave. And they were saying, uh, he said they were, it's so, bo two teenagers, it's so boring here. And i never forget, she looked at them and she said, there are 5 million people in my town and my teenagers say the same thing. <laughs> It was it was a it was a great trip. Um, if anybody's interested, uh, I have a number of these books. I'm glad to sign them, and uh, they're fifteen dollars, and they'll pay for my gas to get back to Marvel. Thank you. Thank you. And Alex has some people he wants to recognize. Oh, yes, thank you. 